If you want to finally understand descriptive statistics, this is the place to be. Why is descriptive statistics so important? Let's say a company wants to know how its employees travel to work. So the company creates a survey to answer this question. Once enough data has been collected, this data can be analyzed using descriptive statistics. But what is descriptive statistics? Descriptive statistics aims to describe and summarize a data set in a meaningful way. But it is important to note that descriptive statistics only describe the collected data without drawing conclusions about a larger population. Put simply, just because we know how some people from one company get to work, we cannot say how all working people of the company get to work. This is the task of inferential statistics. To describe data descriptively, we now look at the four key components. Measures of central tendency, measures of dispersion, frequency tables and charts. Let's start with the first one, measures of central tendency. Measures of central tendency are for example the mean, the median and the mode. Let's first have a look at the mean. The arithmetic mean is the sum of all observations divided by the number of observations. An example. Imagine we have the test scores of 5 students. To find the mean score, we sum up all the scores and divide by the number of scores. The mean test score of these 5 students is therefore 86.6. What about the median? When the values in a dataset are arranged in ascending order, the median is the middle value. If there is an odd number of data points, the median is simply the middle value. If there is an even number of data points, the median is the average of the two middle values. It is important to note that the median is resistant to extreme values or outliers. Let's look at this example. No matter how tall the last person is, the person in the middle remains the person in the middle. So the median does not change. But if we look at the mean, it does have an effect on how tall the last person is. The mean is therefore not robust to outliers. Let's continue with the mode. The mode refers to the value or values that appear most frequently in a set of data. For example, if 14 people travel to work by car, 6 by bike, 5 walk and 5 take public transport, then car occurs most often and is therefore the mode. Great, let's continue with the measures of dispersion. Measures of dispersion describe how spread out the values in a dataset are. Measures of dispersion are for example the variance and standard deviation, the range and the interquartile range. Let's start with the standard deviation. The standard deviation indicates the average distance between each data point and the mean. But what does that mean? Each person has some deviation from the mean. Now we want to know how much the persons deviate from the mean value on average. In this example, the average deviation from the mean value is 11.5 cm. To calculate the standard deviation, we can use this equation. Sigma is the standard deviation, n is the number of persons, xi is the size of each person and x bar is the mean value of all persons. But attention! There are two slightly different equations for the standard deviation. The difference is that we have once 1 divided by n and once 1 divided by n minus 1. To keep it simple, if our survey doesn't cover the whole population, we always use this equation to estimate the standard deviation. Likewise, if we have conducted a clinical study, then we also use this equation to estimate the standard deviation. But what is the difference between the standard deviation and the variance? As we now know, the standard deviation is the quadratic mean of the distance from the mean. The variance now is the squared standard deviation. If you want to know more details about the standard deviation and the variance, please watch our video. Let's move on to range and interquartile range. It is easy to understand. The range is simply the difference between the maximum and minimum value. Interquartile range represents the middle 50% of the data. It is the difference between the first quartile Q1 
And the third quartile, Q3. Therefore, 25% of the values are smaller than the interquartile range and 25% of the values are larger. The interquartile range contains exactly the middle 50% of the values. Before we get to the last two points, let's briefly compare measures of central tendency and measures of dispersion. Let's say we measured the blood pressure of patients. Measures of central tendency provide a single value that represents the entire dataset, helping to identify a central value around which data points tend to cluster. Measures of dispersion, like the standard deviation, the range and the interquartile range indicate how spread out the data points are, whether they are closely packed around the center or spread far from it. In summary, while measures of central tendency provide a central point of the dataset, measures of dispersion describe how the data is spread around the center. Let's move on to tables. Here we will have a look at the most important ones, frequency tables and contingency tables. A frequency table displays how often each distinct value appears in a dataset. Let's have a closer look at the example from the beginning. A company surveyed its employees to find out how they get to work. The options given were car, bicycle, walk and public transport. Here are the results from 30 employees. The first answered car, the next walk and so on and so forth. Now we can create a frequency table to summarize this data. To do this, we simply enter the four possible options car, bicycle, walk and public transport in the first column and then count how often they occurred. From the table, it is evident that the most common mode of transport among the employees is by car, with 14 employees preferring it. The frequency table thus provides a clear and concise summary of the data. But what if we have not only one but two categorical variables? This is where the contingency table, also called cross-tab, comes in. Imagine the company doesn't have one factory, but two. One in Detroit and one in Cleveland. So we also ask the employees at which location they work. If we want to display both variables, we can use a contingency table. A contingency table provides a way to analyze and compare the relationship between two categorical variables. The rows of a contingency table represent the categories of one variable, while the columns represent the categories of another variable. Each cell in the table shows the number of observations that fall into the corresponding category combination. For example, the first cell shows that car and Detroit were answered six times. And what about the charts? Let's take a look at the most important ones. To do this, let's simply use datadep.net. If you like, you can load this sample dataset with the link in the video description. Or you just copy your own data into this table. Here below you can see the variables distance to work, mode of transport and site. Datadep gives you a hint about the level of measurement, but you can also change it here. Now, if we only click on mode of transport, we get a frequency table and we can also display the percentage values. If we scroll down, we get a bar chart and a pie chart. Here on the left, we can adjust for the settings. For example, we can specify whether we want to display the frequencies or the percentage values or whether the bars should be vertical or horizontal. If you also select site, we get a cross table here and a grouped bar chart for the diagrams. Here we can specify whether we want the chart to be grouped or stacked. If we click on distance to work and mode of transport, we get a bar chart where the height of the bar shows the mean value of the individual groups. Here we can also display the dispersion. We also get a histogram, a box plot, a violin plot and a rainbow plot. If you would like to know more about what a box plot, a violin plot and a rainbow plot are, take a look at my videos. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video.